Hello, everyone. Tommy, World at War Comics, and thanks for joining us today. We have another fantastic show. But before we get into that, if you could hit that ring bell, hit that subscribe button, really helps out the channel. Um, today, we have a couple sponsors that are back for season two. We have CN Chilies, the best hot sauce you will be able to find on the internet. Go to C I E N C H I. Um, les.com cn chilies use comics at checkout save 15 percent off your entire order i promise you you're gonna love this hot sauce and also we got comic crusaders back again um man the best in comic book reviews movie reviews music reviews um i would follow them on youtube they also have some amazing interviews but uh comic crusaders is back all right without further ado i'm so excited for this next guest um it is rodney barnes he is the executive producer and writer for several of your favorite TV shows. Um, he is the writer and creator of Philadelphia. Um, he currently is on Luke Cage for Marvel, um, Mandalorian. Um, Rodney has done it all. I cannot wait for you to listen to this interview. Um, some of it, like I said, everyone hates Chris, um, the boondocks, um, just amazing. The the Lakers uh, dynasty um, show from HBO. He's done so many amazing um, different projects. I think you're going to really love this interview. We dive into all of it. I hope you enjoy. Without further ado, here is Rodney and I. Thanks, everybody. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining World at War Comics. Today, we have an amazing guest, Mr. Rodney Barnes, writer extraordinaire, producer, comic writer, award-winning. Um, you kind of done it all, Rodney. Just a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> A little, a little bit. bit. I've had a couple of jobs. I've had a couple of <laughs> You've jobs. done all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Your Wikipedia page is uh, pretty long. That's always Thank a good you. sign. That's yeah. a good sign. That's, That's a, good a good sign. sign. That's, That's a really good sign. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe we could kind of go over a little bit of your career. I mean, you've done some pretty amazing stuff. I thought maybe we could touch on the executive producer side of uh, your experience. You've done some pretty amazing stuff with Boondocks. Everybody Hates Chris, which I watched quite a bit of that, which mm -hmm. is awesome. Um, can you kind of go back in time and maybe share with us where that passion for writing um, started in your life? Has it always kind of been there? Um, <clears throat> I think it's more of a desire to be creative as much as anything. I mean, um, I've always loved the arts. I've always loved film, television, movies, theater, um, art, like conventional art. Um and comic books. And so it's always been a part of my life. And I've had teachers and folks support me and kind of point out that I had a relationship with words. And if I ever wanted to be a good writer, that I put my the effort into it, maybe I could be a good writer. So um, that's sort of where it all started, you know, in childhood. I never really thought it would ever end up to having a conversation with you about my career. I never thought I'd have a career. Yeah. Um, but Things sort of kind of worked out. Yeah. I read, um, you know, as I was going through a little bit of your history, you, you paid quite a price, um, I think, moving from the East Coast to the West Coast to really mm -hmm. get your start in Hollywood. I, if I'm not mistaken, you spent a little time in your car as you were trying to search for that that opening. Can you kind of share a little bit about that process, what that was like? And obviously it's paid off, but uh, that must have been really scary at that time. It wasn't scary. I mean, no. it was a pain in the ass, but it wasn't really scary. I mean, I lived in my car for on and off for about a year and a half. Um, uh, you know, when you're working on movies, it takes 12, 14 hours a day anyway. Um, transportation gave me gasoline. Craft service gave me food. Um, I could take a shower in the honey wagon. So it was like, you know, it was sort of... Um, boot camp in a way and I was working on movies every day so I got to be around the thing that I ultimately wanted to be a part of so it wasn't as bad as like I'll have friends who have kids and um, who want to get into business and they'll ask me for advice and they'll say things and you know we always get to that point of um, so my kid needs a job you know and I'm like yeah I understand and they don't want to go through that process or prospect of having to sleep in their car or go through any hardship whatsoever. They're looking for it to be like it is in conventional life where you fill out an application and you get a job and you survive. Um, but that's sort of not how Hollywood works. And in a way, it weeds out people mm -hmm. by 
your inability to go through the difficult period, unless nepotism comes into play or some somebody gets fortunate or, you know, they fall into the right place at the right time. I think the vast majority of folks have to go through, you know, this minefield of uncertainty um, in order to get a career or gain a foothold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, as you were working in Hollywood and uh, you started to write and produce some of your own shows, is there, I mean, you've done so much, like we talked about Boondocks, we talked about Everyone um, Hates Chris, um, and you've done a lot more. I mean, even you were part of the the Laker Dynasty show with HBO. Is there one that kind of stands out for, for, um, for you in your experience? Like that's like kind of the pinnacle of what I've done in Hollywood so far? The next one. Um, no, uh, not really. I mean, I learned something from all of them, you mm -hmm. know, what to do or sometimes what not to do, but, um, there isn't one, they all sort of, um, they all sort of blend together. It's like you, it's all about learning and getting better and trying to evolve into whatever the best version of me is. And so that's a journey. That's really, um, figuring out from gig to gig, uh, project to project um who i am and they all test me in different ways yeah you know as a writer and you're trying to express um you know that that vision that you have um there's always a lot of noise um you know some people accept it some people won't like it how do you stay true to that vision and not allow kind of the noise around you to affect um that vision it always affects you. I mean, um, no one wants to hear anything negative, but there's a reality that's larger than your feeling. Um, feelings aren't facts. You know, they're feelings. And you have to be able to navigate them and understand understand the reality of the world that you've entered. Um, if you make something, somebody's not going to like it. There are people who don't like Star Wars. You know, there are people who don't like... Name your favorite thing that yeah. you think is great. That pe some people don't like the new Godzilla movie, you know, the minus one. Like some people, there's always going to be that person invariably that doesn't like something. Um, you can't allow that to derail the process, even though that's like a lightning rod. Um, you know, you see that you can have a thousand people say they love something, that one person that eloquently states their hatred of that thing. And that's the person who gets the attention. But you still have to understand that regardless of um, of that criticism, you still have to endure. Um, that's just the reality of it. You know, would it be great that if everybody loved every single thing? Sure. But that's unrealistic. Yeah, yeah. Can you, I don't even know if this is possible, but can you kind of share what maybe the top lesson that you've learned working in Hollywood and is that lesson something that you've been able to utilize in some of the other things that you've done specifically around comic books and storytelling? Um, yeah. I mean, I think it would be to develop your own voice. I mean, if you look at my career, the first decade of my career was really trying to figure out the landscape of Hollywood, the math of Hollywood, how it all works, um, where I fit in it. The second half is probably about developing my own voice and figuring out where I fit specifically as a creator and as a, as an artist, you know, you have to, you think about your favorite guys. Like I loved um, the early Alan Moore stuff, Swamp Thing and all of that. Um, and Alan Moore's voice was so different than some other folks' voice, you know, and Frank Miller's voice, you know, I think about that Daredevil run and Dark Knight Returns and all of that. Um, he had a very distinctive voice. And I think you you look at a Jordan Peele movie, you can tell a Jordan Peele movie from every other movie. You know, it's um you can loosely say Hitchcock, but it's specifically his. There's a point where you're going to have to really think when you get in one of those movies. Um, and you go down the list, John Carpenter, George Romero, whoever. And so at a certain point, survival really comes up with figuring out what your voice is, what you have to contribute beyond just being a gun for hire. What is it that you do? And then honing and refining that to a place where it's a marketable skill. And it takes a while. You know, some people can do it quickly. Some people know who they are coming out of college and they just have the right thing at the right time. I wasn't one of those people. 
you know, it took me a while to sort of figure out what I do well um, and what I don't do well and how do you improve one while maintaining whatever it is, the, the virtues while you're dealing with the vices. Makes a lot of sense. Um, can you kind of share some of the newer projects that you're working on? I read that maybe uh, something's happening with uh, Philadelphia. Can you kind of share a little bit about where that's currently at? Yeah, Philadelphia has been in development for a year and a half. And um, the strike sort of, the writer strike sort of slowed everything down. But we were in the process of uh, putting it all together. Um, uh, Andre Brower, who just passed away, um, he had agreed to attach himself to play James Sangster, um, as uh, and was pretty proud of that because I'm a huge, still a huge Andre Brower fan from, especially the TV show Homicide, which was one of my great inspirations and made me want to be a writer. Um, but we're in the process of attaching actors, attaching directing, you know, all of that kind of stuff. The 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 whole process of what it takes to put a TV show together in this modern world. It's different than it was in the 90s and the early 2000s. Now it's the business of putting a show together. It's not so much just the creative of putting a show together. So we're we're slowly but surely, you know, plugging along. And it'll be a, a series, not a feature film, correct? No, it'll be a series. It'll it will be a series. series. And yeah. I, I read somewhere, I believe, is it going to be on Netflix or that hasn't been decided yet? Hasn't been decided yet. Okay. But but at some point it will be. I mean, yeah. um, I can take it anywhere. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. You know, um, when I I look at uh, your your body of work, it seems like horror has kind of been that one genre that uh, you seem to have a real passion for. Can you kind of talk about that? And am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's certainly a segment of it. When I started, mm -hmm. I started in sitcoms, and it wasn't because I wanted to always be in sitcoms. I've always appreciated a lot of those things. And I've been fortunate enough to grow up in a world where there were only three channels, and so you were inundated with just television. It wasn't like, now you can sort of parcel out it's so much TV that you can pick and choose what you want, what you don't want. But um, I grew up on sitcoms and the first decade of my career, you know, between the boondocks, everybody hates Chris and my wife and kids were sitcoms. So there was that, but I always had this burning desire, like horror. If you ask me what the start was, it was the Hammer films, the Universal Monsters, um, then there was this weird bridge period with Cole Shack, the Night Stalker, written by the late great Richard Matheson, and um, uh, Salem's Lot, the Salem's Lot miniseries. Um, and shout out to the rest in peace to David Soul, um, who just passed away. But um, those two projects for television sort of retweaked my idea of what television could be. You know, if I ever had this ideal world and stuff like the X Files and Night Gallery and all of that. Um, I wanted to throw my my hat in the ring of doing that kind of stuff. And, you know, for the first decade, I was figuring out who I was in the business and did I have that stuff? You know, I, I didn't walk into the door with this super confidence of I can do anything. It was more of, oh, my God, uh, do I really belong here? And I hope someone doesn't find out that I don't. So and kick me back to Maryland. Um, so, you know. I think there's this thing with horror where I've always loved it. Um, I think that the stuff that I love, um, they don't make as much of it anymore. You know, I think of a movie like The Exorcist and nothing really happened for the first 45 minutes. And now if you go see a horror film, the first five minutes, there's a jump scare. Right. Um, so it's a different world that we live in, but I have a podcast called run fool and, um, that I tell scary stories um, once a week, every Tuesday on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get fine podcasts. And that I have, I have a YouTube show coming and a few other things that are coming from horror. I may be writing and directing a horror film. Um, I do a bunch of horror comics, like the ones that you have in front of you right now. So yeah, horror has its own little real estate in my head and my heart. And um, I hope to always have some a foot in it in some way, shape or form. You know, when it comes to Philadelphia, and I think uh, issue 33 comes out here in the next week or two, mm -hmm. um, as you're writing, how far in advance do you know where the story is going, um, especially in a 
in a title like this that has been going on for close to three years now? I mean, how far out are you writing and, and do you know where the story is going to go? Um, there's a dual answer to that. I have a faint sketch in my head, um, like where it's going, like where each story arc is going. I don't know until I put pen to paper where how exactly I'm going to execute the story. I know that I don't want it to be, if you read Philadelphia on a regular basis, you know that one issue is nothing like the issue before it. Like I will go in and say, okay, that one was kind of sad. Let me make a funny one. Let me make a melancholy one. Let me make one that has some meaning. Let me do this. You know, so I'm writing the story to that and I'm blessed to partner with Jason Sean Alexander um, who is great at interpreting human emotions so that we can do virtually any type of story. So, you know, his ability with facial expressions and body language and those things, um, you know, sometimes I'll write a scene just to see whether or not he can draw it and he hasn't let me down yet. Um, but it's always about tonal, tonal shifts in story for me when it comes to Philadelphia. And um, I typically don't have that too far in advance. I just know that where I want the story arc to start and end. And um, yeah. And can you kind of share the process of how a spawn becomes part of the universe that you've created? Because that's from a business sense or a creative sense? Maybe both, because I think they're very different, right? But uh, I think it's very unique. And I love that uh, Spawn is part of this world. It's pretty amazing. From a business point, Jason calls me and says, hey, you think Spawn could work in the world? And I'm like, yeah, I'll figure out something. And then he calls Todd McFarlane because they're kind of cool. And, um, you know, Jason has done Spawn. And I think they're doing some other things together. Mm -hmm. And then Todd will say yes or no. And then Jason hits me in with a yes. And then, but you got to pitch him the story. And then we set up a Zoom. And then I pitched Todd McFarlane the story. And he says yes or no. And he gives me the boundaries by which to work within and what Spawn does and what Spawn doesn't do. And the same thing with Savage Dragon. And um, Blackula is sort of my own, mm -hmm. you know, I have the literary rights for a second. So um, I can do with that. And Dracula's Dracula. So, um yeah. And from the creative side, it's just more of walking a tightrope between having Spawn fit into a world and not overwhelm a world. You know, it's like um, you have to give Spawn his due because Spawn is Spawn. And our characters in the Philadelphia world occupy that world. So you don't want them to take a back seat to a guest, but you also don't want to give the guest his due. So it's more of threading a needle and making sure everybody's playing nice together. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I follow you on Instagram and then, um, I'm, I'm pretty friendly, um, with David Crownson okay. who uh, does Harriet Tubman demon slayer. And I saw you, he's a friendly guy. He's a very, he's friendly such guy. an amazing, such he's an amazing a very young affable. Man. I wish I could be as happy as he is. He is incredible. I mean, I had him on and I, on the show, and I think we talked about Batman for an hour and a half before we even talked about his comic. I had a blast. I would love to have him on again. But I saw that you two were sitting down. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's too early, but I don't know if there's a possibility that maybe Harriet Tubman makes a little surprise, or can you talk to that? We, we're talking about it. You know, if yeah. we can get the legalities and all of that stuff together with um, MGM and mm -hmm. see uh, what they'll do, uh, you know, anytime you're dealing with a corporate entity. Yeah. It's a difficult, it's a difficult thing, but um, but yeah, we'll see. I love David. I love Harry Tubman and what he's done with the book, and um, it'd be an honor to be able to work with him. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's a there's another uh, gentleman. I don't know if you know him, uh, Newton Lalavos, and he owns Dream Fury Comics. Don't know him, no. Yeah, I'll send you a little bit, but I I think he would be another one that would be amazing. His comics are incredible, absolutely Check amazing. Him out. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Um, so Ronnie, you know, some of the, uh, comics you've been writing for a uh, Marvel off and on for a little while now, um, mm -hmm. Star Wars, Lando, Mandalorian, um, obviously Luke Cage and gang war and how that all fits into that whole gang war. Um, you know, growing up, what comic books, um, did you kind of grow up a Marvel guy, a DC guy? It seems like maybe a Marvel, but. Um, it's a weird mixture of things. I was a huge Neil Adams fan and, um, those covers that he would do for Batman and Green Lantern and House of Mystery and all of those books, 
they grabbed my eye. I mean, I loved that. I loved Mike Rell and Legion of Superheroes. We used to fight over those books, I remember, in school. Um, Swamp Thing. I would. I was a titles person. I didn't really, you know, differentiate between Marvel or DC. It was whatever caught my eye because as a kid, kid, you're not reading in depth, you know, um, talking about five, six, seven years old. But um, as I got older, the great thing about comics is they went through this period where they started to become like serious and literature, you know, as I was getting older too. So stuff like Swamp Thing and Miracle Man and uh, War uh, Warlock, Jim Starlin's run on Warlock and Captain Marvel, and then Infinity Gauntlet and those things started to ask questions about life. And, you know, they became much more evolved as, um, as stories. And I was coming of age and actually paying attention during that period of time. And that's when I think the love affair with comics in a fully realized way came about because in the beginning it was more pretty pictures and cool stories. And I was just looking for adventure, but then I think as I got older, I was looking for meaning and comics started to give me that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. Can you, can you kind of speak to um, how important it is that, that vision that you have comes across in your work and how specific are mm -hmm. you and how careful are you that that does come across? Cause I have heard stories in Hollywood where you might have a vision, but a lot of times that vision, there's a lot of things added and taken away from that. How do you, I mean, is it really difficult to kind of stay true to a vision when you're trying to write or. It's according to the, the what's the task. You know, if you're talking about an indie book like Philadelphia, we do what we want to do. And most of my indie work has been that. When you talk about the big two, um, and I've got a couple of projects at DC now, and so it's like you still have to work within the boundaries of the characters that they own and have legacies and all of that. You know, if you look at Philadelphia and you see all of this meaning and gods and all of that stuff, and then you look at a book like Gang War and you see fights, you know, you see a lot of action and you know, there's not so much of the gods and life and death and characters pondering, um, you know, that you don't really ponder when you've got 20 pages of action um, that you have to fulfill. Um, so it's different with each one. And what's the legacy? You know, the Star Wars books have their own between Lucasfilm and Marvel. You know, you've got your boundaries. You have to stay in with the legacies that those characters kind of walk with and what's happening on the TV shows and the movies because the comic books are canon as well. So there's that. Um, so each world that you jump in, there are different rules. And, you know, we always have our Philadelphia world uh, to come back to and kind of do what we want. Is there a character... Um in Marvel and or DC that you would love to get your hands on because you have the perfect story for it, or just you love that character and you would love to kind of handle it for a little while. There are two of them and I'm actually doing them in 2024. So, oh, okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll hold off on that. then. <laughs> yeah. So if I say them, I'm, I'm kind of giving it away and they might get uh, mad and say things, but both of the characters, if you follow my work, hopefully by the summer and whenever the announcement comes, you'll say, Oh, okay. That was what he was talking about. Well, that's pretty based, exciting. Yeah, they're 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 big characters. They're like the bigger name characters and um ten pole characters in um those worlds. Well, that's pretty exciting to get to a point in your career where you do have those opportunities to be able to take mm -hmm. on some of those uh titles that maybe you had a passion for and you know a story. Yeah, big time. I mean, um and I think, you know, what I learned, the first book I ever did was Falcon. And when I look at that book, sometimes I see all the mistakes. Uh, I see um, the wordiness. I see all the plotting, you know, plotting story sometimes. Some people like it, and I appreciate that. And I like parts of it as well. And I think Josh Cacera's art is fantastic and saved me in a lot of areas. But I certainly hadn't developed my voice yet as what I was going to be in the comic book world. You know, I'd done it for film and TV, and I thought I would be able to just transfer one to the other, but they're not the same. And it took a while to, and and God bless the industry for giving me the opportunity to do four, five, six series to where, oh, okay, this is what I do well. This is what I don't do as well. And to figure that part out, because that's the thing, I think, um, for anybody who's a writer, artist, um, what have you, it takes a while for you to figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at. 
And you can have a modicum, you can have a, a high degree of talent, but not necessarily know what to do with it. Um, so God bless the industry for giving me an opportunity. You know, that, that's a, a great point. And, and one of the questions I love to ask either writers or artists, but there's like this dance that takes place between the writer and the artist, right? I mean, and like you just kind of mentioned, you're, you're kind of limited on the words that you're allowed to use to tell the story, right? Because you can't get too wordy or maybe you don't have enough words to help with that story. But the art really needs to tell a large portion of that story too. Can you kind of walk through how important that is? And it seems like you and Jason have this amazing relationship where that always comes through. But can you kind of talk about how that dance is so important between writer and artist? Yeah, well, first, thank you for that. Uh, the second part is when I'm... I remember turning in my first script for Falcon and my editor came back to me and said uh, the script was ponderous, which isn't a great word. And I went back to when I was reading comics and how Alan Moore's, if you look at Alan Moore's Miracle Man scripts, there were a lot of words and Swamp Thing. And I'm thinking that's what it is because that's all I really read. And then when I, uh, I got the art back, I remember you damn near couldn't see the art because it was so many words. And what that evolution as a writer became was how can I say more with less and how can I support the art and how can I, you know, pace the art in a particular way, instead of trying to write a book with pictures in it, um, trying to do a thing where there's a seamless transition from one panel to the next and how we move. And, you know, I think the thing with Jason and I, you know, Jason having had some pedigree in the business, um, in those earlier books, being able to give me advice here, maybe you could cut down words there. But by the time we started Philadelphia, I had done seven or eight runs on different things, smaller things. I had done some things for Dynamite. I had done some things for Lion Forge and um, the Star Wars books. So I sort of had a rhythm as to um, how I wanted to to say more with less. And because I love Jason's art so much, you know, I think that's the... Um, that's sort of expressing what I want you to see. And I just want the, I want the words to support it more so than try to carry it or diminish it in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and one more question concerning comic books, you know, you have Alice Cooper. Um, mm -hmm. I saw some of your videos on um, the Laker dynasty HBO series. Can you talk about the research that goes into some of these type of titles and how you yeah. handle that? I mean, that, that seems like it's, there's a lot of behind the scenes things that go into something like that. And I think as a, a viewer, sometimes you forget about that. Yeah, I think um, for the Lakers series, it was really more, we read a lot of books. There were books, there were articles, it was YouTube stuff, it was interviews. And you just spend the first season really digesting all of that stuff. And you have researchers and you have folks who just provide you things and give you things. And then you read all of that stuff, you take it in and you sort of have to push it to the side and figure out what's the through line of the story you're trying to tell from your point of view while using that information as sort of the track that you're laying in order to be able to, to see the rest of it through. And even for Alice Cooper, it's reading, um, Neil Gaiman did a series before um, my series for Alice Cooper. And you know, I remember Alice Cooper as my mother had an album or two and he would come on the radio and figuring out who he was and what what he did would support the type of story that I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell a fun story. And um, I think our story is pretty fun. And Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's really more of finding out the truth, you know. And then how can I support the truth with this story that walks with truth, but isn't necessarily truth? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, kind of the last question, Rodney, um, as we look at the comic book industry as a whole, um, indie and independent comics, I think, have really exploded over the last few years. You have Kickstarter, Indiegogo. It seems like the entrance into comic books as a writer or a creator is more available today than it ever has been in the past. Do you have any kind of insight that you could provide a, a new creator who has an idea that's getting into comics for the first time? Is there any uh, advice that you could provide for that creator when it comes to comic books? Well, I mean, I think um, just from a business standpoint, finding a publisher that has a reputable mm -hmm. track record you know, and working with people who are new to the business. 
Um, there's that. And then if you want to self-publish, that's always a possibility at this point. I mean, there was no internet when I was coming up. Um, and now you have ways of communicating with artists and, and publishers and editors and people that you don't even know just by getting their emails. And, um, you know, oftentimes they're published in the books. So you have a way of contacting those people. When I was coming up, you had to go, go up to the Javits Center in New York because I'm from Maryland and hope you found an editor and maybe there was a picture of one and, and you went over and you harassed them until they said, get away from me or they took some interest in you. So I think it's more of um, being able to position yourself with the right people early on and doing your due diligence research wise to see who, you know, what folks have had a good experience with who, you know, you got social media now. And if anybody gets stiff for a check there, they can't wait to tell the world, um, you know, and, and making if it's self-publishing, building relationship with comic shops and, you know, the owners and figuring out how to, um, you know, getting good with them and learn from them. You know, uh, Earth 2, uh, Earth 2 Comics in Sherman Oaks, California is my home um, comic shop. And, um, you know, Carr, who runs it, is sort of uh, always I'm always in his ear how best because I have my own imprint. You know, what are, what are folks looking for? How do you, you know, how do you build these relationships? What do you do? And the, the great thing with comics and also the most frustrating thing with comics is with each step, you're learning because there is no one way to do anything. There used to be Diamond and now you have a bunch of different distribu distributing uh, companies, uh, distribution companies and places of how books come out. And you had Comixology for a minute and you have different just different ways, you know, how do you communicate with people? Because we're past the age of spinner racks where you could go into the corner store and see for 20 cents, you can get this disposable entertainment. Um, every, I didn't even know when they came out. This just would be new ones that would be up on the, uh, on the spinner rack every day or every week, whatever. Um, now you got to go every Wednesday to a comic shop and, you know, just the culture of comics you know, there's something about it that, like I said, is frustrating, but also something that's cool about it, too, the unpredictable nature of it. Um, as a, a comic book writer, I assume you still have uh, time to be a fan of comics as well. Mm -hmm. Are there any titles um, that uh, you kind of stay up on because you're enjoying the story? Um, I follow creatives, you know, the old folks that are my age from the Bronze Age, I still follow when they do something. And I love seeing them at the cons. I, if you saw my picture with Mike Grell, you would have thought it was with Michael Jordan, um, you know, and got to know Neil Adams before he passed. And he did a cover for us for issue five of Philadelphia. And, um, you know, so that part is always cool. Um, I still go to a comic shop every Wednesday. I buy a bunch of books that I don't read. Um, they're still in the bags. And then at some point during the year, I take them all out of the bag and put them in a comic box, in a long box. Um, not because of anything to do with um, the books. It's just life gets in the way. And the kid that got a big cup of lemonade and laid across his bed and read a stack of comic books, those days are gone because I don't get an opportunity to lay across the bed and read a stack of anything. Um, but I do, you know, try to stay within, um, supporting range of a lot of guys that I know, the Tinians and Scott Snyder and, you know, um, Jeff Lemire and just, you know, a lot of writers and see the cool stuff that they do and, you know, hope that my stuff is somewhere in the orbit of the things that they do. And, um, you know, I'm just happy to be part of the community at this point. Yeah, yeah. I think the community is happy. You're part of it too, Rodney. Uh, okay. um, loving, loving Philadelphia. Um, right. I don't know if there is anything else that you wanted to kind of share um, before we let you get back to work. I know you're pretty busy. Um, no, I mean, um, this is 2024 is looking to be a pretty big year. We got Philadelphia going. We got another horror cover coming for volumes three and four. Um, a lot of guest stars still in that book. I think I have four Star Wars series that are dropping and um, the two surprise things coming from DC and um, you never know what else is in there. And, you know, you wake up virtually every morning, there's some email from someone saying, hey, would you like to do X, Y, Z? And I'm like, but I've got a few jobs ahead, but I try to figure out a way and then say yes and figure out and have an editor mad at me. You said you were going to have it yesterday. 
Um, but a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff as far as comics are concerned, as far as television, I'm doing a mini series um, on HBO about Jack Johnson, um, the fighter with yeah. Mahershala Ali. I got a few movies. Um, uh, it's one in um, at Netflix. I think this in pre-production. I got uh, the Longest Yard. I've got another in development. Um, a lot of stuff to do. A lot of stuff to do. Well, that, I think that even paints the picture of how appreciative I am that you spent some time with me oh, uh, today, Happy Ronnie. Time. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, Roddy, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you stopping by and uh, spending time with us. Big fan of uh, everything that you do. We'll Thank be you. watching very closely in 2024. I'll be picking up those uh, comics, especially the DC ones at the end of the year. I can't wait to find out what titles those are. Um, but uh, again, thank you, Rodney. I wish you the very best and appreciate you stopping by. Well, thank you. And the next time we talk, you'll have to tell me how you're able to get all of your action figures to stand up at the same time. <laughs> I've never been able to figure that one out. All of mine would lay down at some yeah. point, like uh, somebody just pushed the black. <laughs> off. But Once in a while, my, my dog will come in and hit the door because he wants to find oh, yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. And then it slams and then like 10 of them drop. So yeah. there you go. There yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. cool. All right. Roddy, thank you so much. Appreciate Likewise. you. And uh, we'll talk soon, okay? All right, brother. You take it easy. You too. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.